All right, here we are, another episode of Let There Be Talk, a fantastic guest today. Introduce yourself, my man. Hey, Mike Levine from Triumph here. Still alive and well. Yeah, but you look great, man. You you always had the best look in the band. <laughs> Thanks. No one's ever said that before. That's a compliment. It's, it's true, man. You just had that incredible kind of 70s, is he in Marshall Tucker, Skinner, kind of, you know, that vibe with the with the jazz bass and, you know, especially that Us Festival era with the trucker hat and, and just killing it, man. Oh, that's so cool. I miss those days. Those, those were a lot of fun. Those days were a lot of fun, man. A lot of fun. You know, when they pitched uh, having you on the show, I immediately said yes, because uh, one of the most epic days of my life or epic weekends, I would say, was 1983, the US Festival. I was there and I have talked to numerous people that played the show, Rudy Sarza with Quiet Riot, Nikki Six, Motley Crue, Rob Halford, Judas Priest. So it is uh, an honor to have you on and hear your views and your uh, memories of that incredible weekend. It was pretty much incredible. I mean, we missed most of the weekend. We, we were lucky to get there to play because we were in the, um, uh, we were playing the day before with ZZ Top at the, or the Tangerine Bowl in Orlando. So we had to fly, we went right from the stage there, into a limo, in our stage clothes, right to the airport, changed in the car before we got there, uh, made the flight and landed in Los Angeles, you know, five hours later, then had a helicopter to the hotel, I call it the motel, <laughs> uh, that was closest to the, the venue where everybody was staying. So it was, uh, uh, it started off. It started off with that that whole the day. So we missed the first day, but so uh, it's a heavy metal Sunday, man. It was the uh, probably it's got to be. It's if it's not the number one career highlight for me, it's the number one and a half career highlight. You know, so uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's interesting because you got to think about Triumph. You know, you guys have. Your uh, your hit in '79 with "Lay It on the Line." You played a, a, a Canada Jam, which was like a hundred thousand people or whatever. But this was a whole different thing because you were still kind of culty in America, and you were getting some radio uh, play with "Fight the Good Fight," you know, and Magic Power. But there was still that thing where Triumph was, uh, you know, it was a kind of a cult following. So. It had to be insane for you to to play, be part of this. Um, it was, but you know they chose the, um, uh, the not only the bands but the order of billing. Uh, certainly, the first uh, four for all that Halo Scorch, Triumph, Ozzy, Priest. I believe it out crew and Quiet Riot because they were not really, you know, really big yet at that point. <clears throat> But those five bands were the top grossing bands on tour, on the road. So we were selling out everywhere. And we did on you know, the Allied Forces tour, we sold out everywhere. So, uh, you know, we were hotter than a pistol on the road. Uh, you know, Van Halen was number one. On the road, Scorps were two. And we were ahead of Ozzy and Priest. <laughs> you know, as far as number of people at shows, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, we felt we belonged there. I mean, we turned down. The choice for us was to do three shows at Juan Pizzeria or, or do the S Festival. So we had a decision because the last play in LA was at the Rose Bowl where we co headlined with Journey and did 110,000 people. Wow. So we were due for an indoor play, you know, with to show the big production, the big triumph show. And, uh, it went right down to the last minute. We were not sure we were going to do it, but we they gave us a deadline, and we had uh, Brian Murphy from Avalon Attractions, who was a promoter for the Long Beach shows. Uh, he's at the venue because tickets were available only at the venue. Uh, his parking lot's full there. We got the team from the S Festival on the other phone going, okay, what's, what's the answer? 
Fed lies ticking down. And we said, we got to do the S Festival. There's never going to be, this is like, this is the, the ultimate show to, it's going to be historic. So now, that's what we opted for. Now we do know that Van Halen got the crazy money, you know, was the offer pretty damn big for uh, Triumph? Yeah, yeah, that's like, you know, we got we got we got really good dough to play. Um, uh, we didn't get that Halo money, but uh, you know we're 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 in the ballpark, so to speak. Now let's let's get into that a little bit. So you fly in uh, to the hotel, and was everybody there just getting crazy, or what was happening there? Um, it was uh, relatively, uh, I'll, I'll say. Just very, very low key, you know. We uh, be, uh, you know, my wife met me there, and because uh, that was the last show of a leg we were on, we were going to Palm Springs for a couple of weeks for vacation after after the S Fest. Um, so we were, uh, you know, pretty laid back. We were pretty whacked out, tired, but nonetheless, it was still daylight there, and <laughs> so. We're, out by the pool, and uh, you know, I was just sitting there holding the court with Michael Anthony, and uh, you know, we hit it off. Just had a good time, laughed and scratched, and a lot of interviews, a lot of media around, and that kind of thing. But it was really kind of very chill and cool. Now uh, we know that Joe Walsh was supposed to be on that day, and that's funny because you guys used to cover Joe Walsh, but then he got moved to the third day because he wanted to be with Stevie Nicks, who I, I guess he was dating at the time, and they put Quiet Riot on. But uh, that would have been an interesting, uh, you know, add into this heavy metal day, right? Because that's kind of a Joe Walsh is incredible, one of my favorites, but he's definitely not. If you looked at that card, you'd be like, "What's going on there?" Yeah, that was pretty weird. I thought it was a mistake at first when I first <laughs> heard that he was going to play on the Sunday. All right, that's impossible. That would be like putting David Bowie on or something, right? Like they just made a mistake. Joel should have been on the Bowie day, kind of, which that's where he ended up, right? So, um, but yeah, it would have been great if he was because we would have got him on stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So you're at the hotel and then it's time to go over to the venue. Uh, how many hours ahead before you're on? Are you catching Judas Priest? Because at that show, I sat in those bleachers on the stage and watched Judas Priest. Were you guys at the venue while they were on and seeing? I mean, Judas Priest was absolutely destroying it. Were you guys like, oh man, we've got to really go for it? Because I felt like each band was like going all out. Yeah, I you know I agree. We um, uh, we were there at the venue uh, when Priest was playing, and I meandered my way up to the side stage for for a few minutes just to see if they could survive the heat with the leathers on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but and, but they were fine, you know. They were sweating, but. It's like they they were killing, and I went, okay, that's great. And I wanted to you know, look because they were on while we, just before we got there, got settled, and then Priest went on. So I just wanted to go have a look at the the setup, right? Because there was no sound checks for anybody, regardless, right? So you're just praying that everything's going to work when you get there. Uh, what we had to go through was we have to use rented gear because all our gear was in Florida. So, you know, to have a drums matched up a set of uh, drums like Gil played, had them delivered to the venue, uh, had to hire a drum roadie out there. Uh, Rick used Marshall amps, we brought his pedal board, we had to run all the amps. I used custom made stuff I had to use and I paid SPTs. But it was all okay. You know? Isn't it wild to think about you're about to play in front of the biggest crowd of your life? zero sound check for any of the bands, even the biggest band, you know, like nap, you just walk on and hope it works. <laughs> <laughs> it's just your pray, man. You see, if, if you believe, you pray, you pray to whatever God there is, you know? So. Yeah. Now, when you guys uh, finished, did you hang out and, and watch the rest of the show, the Scorpions and that uh, Van Halen fiasco? 
Uh, Gil and Rick left uh, as quickly as they could because they were flying back to Toronto. <clears throat> Whereas I was staying because I'm, I'm writing a car and driving to Palm Fond Springs with roses. So, uh, so I we hung out for a while, saw the scarps a little bit. I thought it was really cool. Like when they got like David Krebs who managed managed just the band or managed the band, I should say, uh, who is a smart guy and a, a good friend over the years. Uh, you know, he had, he had the U.S. Air Force do the flyby, if you remember that. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> Blue Angels. Yeah, the jets came fed. Zoom! It's, I go, that's very cool. David's a smart guy. Um, uh, yeah, so I saw a bit of the Scorps and then hung out for Van Halen, who were hotter than a pistol for the first 20 minutes. Yeah. And then David started to talk. And David kept talking. And kept talking. I kept talking and continued to talk. And I, Rosie, let's go to the helicopter, get a helicopter back to the hotel and get out of here. <laughs> yeah, boy, you know, I was there and people hit the gates. They were out of there. It was wild because I had a, a, a motor home. My mom had drove us down in a motor home and we were staying in the uh, camp campgrounds. And I think the combination of Dave and it being a thousand degrees that day, people were just like, I'm out of here, you yeah. know? No, it's, it's tough to play last on a show like that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. It, it really is. I don't care if you're Van Halen or well, whoever, right? It's still tough to play last. Yep. Now, what kind of career change did that happen for you guys after that? Did it give you a big uh, another boost up like, bam, you know, because after that, uh, your next record comes out and, you know, uh, you can never surrender or you guys were kind of in between never surrender and fight the good fight allied forces era. Right. On that. Uh, no, never surrender was was out for a while on that. Yeah. 82, yeah, right. Yeah, because I like, I've never surrendered if they do uh, um, you know, late 82 or early 83, I think. Um, so, yeah, we were touring on it, and uh, I can't remember the other. <laughs> but that's like, so the US, US Fest was kind of the culmination of the first leg of the or second leg of the tour or whatever, because I know we went back out. And so, um, to answer your question, I guess. Thunder 7 was the next record, and we were changing labels uh, at that point. So we had got Thunder 7 was recorded, and we got no war with the record company, and ended up going from RCA, also known as the Record Cemetery of America, to MCA, also known as the Music Cemetery of America. So you do a bunch about rock bands. Yeah. So, yeah. I would have given my eye teeth to be on Mercury Records. Or yeah, 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 yeah. What um, I was going to ask you this uh, when you were up there, it was blazing hot. Um, and maybe the temperature was a little bit dropping by the time you guys were on, but probably not. I just remember it was just a uh, scorcher. How bad was it up there? It was hot. You know, it's, you know, but you're, you, when you walk up there, you go, it's really hot. <laughs> and then you got to play and you forget about the heat because you're thinking about other things that you got to worry about. Yeah. But uh, worse than the heat, I think, because there was really not much direct sun on the stage they had it covered, um, was the dust. The dust was really the tough part to deal with. Because it's it was stuck in your throat. I don't I don't know how Rick and Gil were able to say, to be honest with you. Like I had trouble talking, you know, when I had to do any kind of rap stuff. I was like, I was like, <laughs> I feel I feel the other uh, festival is very underrated, and uh, you know, because that was basically, uh, you know, I'm a junior in high school. And that was my US festival. And I will tell you this right now. I went all three days. I did not see the country day, but I would say it was probably the greatest festival other than the heat 
that I've ever witnessed in America. It went pretty damn smooth for how many people were out there. You know, they say there's 670,000. They say there was a million. They say there's 300. It's all, you know, whatever. Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. It's true. I've got an aerial photo of the uh, venue why Judas Priest is on. Somebody shot from a helicopter. And it looks insane, you know? I mean, the amount of people. Yeah, it's like when we were flying in for for, for the site, we're, going, we're looking down out of the chopper and going, oh man, there's a, oh, that's some of the size of a small city going on down there, you know? And it's like just tons of people, like no empty space, just people, people, people. It was, it was really unbelievable. Wow. I, I do often say that that was the day that I think that record companies and the industry were like, oh, wow, we need to go out and sign us some rock and metal bands. Anything with leather, grab it, right? Probably, yeah. I would think so, although I don't think any of the record companies were there. You know, there's two. <laughs> oh, they're not there, but they're they're seeing the numbers and they're seeing the footage and, and, you know, on the news and everything, they got to be going like, what's going on out there? Yeah. Yeah. Although, you know, record companies were never noted for their smarts, you know? So it's, 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 it's like, who knows? They always thought, you know, heavy rock, heavy metal, whatever was like, you started off saying, Oh, well, somebody says, Oh, it's just a cult thing. Right. Meanwhile, it was selling millions of records, millions of concert tickets. It was the biggest thing going. But it's like, it's a cult thing. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, also an interesting thing with Triumph and a lot of bands back then was, you know, you have Lay It on the Line, but that's in 79. These days, if you didn't have a song hit on the first record, you're gone. Yeah, that's for sure, man. There was a, used to be a thing called artist development. <laughs> back then and it was like okay you didn't have to have a massive hit on your first record now if you don't have a hit in the first 20 minutes you're you're gone history it's like screwed isn't that crazy <laughs> think yeah. about it because well it is it, it is and it isn't because you know for my 10 cents worth the quality of music has 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 gone from being really really good to being really really average in general like I used to say five, ten years ago, I go, could someone please play a guitar solo for me on a record? You know, it was just guys hacking around playing power chords, and but nobody with any chops. Like, you know, if you went to the local music store, you could play it a bit because the, the guitar players were nowhere, you know. But when bands did have guitar players, they did really well, you know. AKA, you know, if you take a band like Nickelback, right? It was really kind of a throwback to that late 70s, mid 80s era. Um, everybody hated them. He thinks the best, still hates the band. But they're a great band. The fans love them. They sell millions of records still, they sell concert tickets, you know? Yeah, that was yeah. a good thing. I met the Nickelback guys uh, last year and super cool guys. And, and then you sit back and you think about like, Hey, why are these guys the whipping boys? There's so many bad bands out there without <laughs> songs. I mean, they got songs, you know, that are being, yeah. they're hit songs. Maybe you're not into that style or something, but it's, uh, you know, there's some songwriting there, a hundred percent. Yeah, so I, it's like, yeah, there, there are some good bands that, that, have, that, are, that are around. I'm not saying everything's bad. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it used to be like baseball. You know, you'd always have every week or two, there'd be a really good band in town. You know, Triumph would be there, two weeks later, Journey would be there, three weeks later, ACDC would be there, a month later, the score, so that in two weeks, the priest, blah, 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 right? It was like, uh, it was like going to a baseball game all the time, right? It's like, okay, here all here, here's all the teams that are coming to town. I want to go see them. Yeah, yeah. What was it like at the early days of Triumph? Because you've been there since the beginning. And uh, so were you guys start out as a cover band or were you just kind of doing that three sets a night in bars? What was happening there? Uh, well, we, um, 
didn't have a lot of original material when we started because we didn't have a lot of original material yet. But, uh, we decided that we were going to do uh, okay. Who's the best of the best that we could we that we could play, pull off, and make sound good that we could compartmentalize into one thirty-minute set uh, that we could do in clubs uh, that would start and it would finish. There'd be no breaks in between. You know, you start at the second run and you end at minute thirty. That for two reasons. One is uh, if you really sucked, nobody would be throwing apples at you for tomatoes. <laughs> They'd have to wait till the end to throw shit at you. So, um, uh, so we did Led Zeppelin, which Rick could cut vocally and we could play, you know, so we do a medley of Led Zeppelin stuff. Uh, Deep Purple, one of our favorite bands, do a medley of Purple. Uh, uh, and, then, and Hendrix, do a, a medley of Hendrix. Then we do a fourth set that would be whatever original material we had, um, and maybe one or two other covers, Snoopy from theirs or something. I think we played most of the music or China Girl, one of those. Uh, but by then, the audience loves us. They're, we, they're, you know, it's like we played some of their favorite music. We blew off Pyro. We had more lights than any other band on the road, the flip fires. And, and it was an exciting show. The fans went crazy. So they accepted our original music, right? And, and encouraged us with that kind of thing. So slowly we eliminated the, the cover stuff and as we got more material. So that's that's what we did in bars. And it worked, you know, but there's one bar was our hometown in Toronto uh, on Young Street, which is a main drag. It was called the Piccadilly Tube. It was kind of downstairs. It had a low ceiling. It was a rough moment for the crew. But we used to, you know, we got to the point where we would, we'd only play there on, on uh, weekends. We wouldn't play weekdays because we, we want to have the place jam. So at one point we said, okay, we did do weekdays at first. Then we said, we can't do that anymore. So we're, we're just going to do weekends, but we're going to do, turn the crowd over. So, you know, there's a cover charge. You know, you got to see the show once and then we do it again. That was for a whole new crowd. And we, at that point, we had bought a, uh, uh, <laughs> a trailer. We owned our own trailer, semi-trailer, 40-foot trailer, but we didn't own the cab yet. But we we park it out on the street in front of the club. The people walk by go, what's going on down there? There's a semi parked in front. It must be something special. So we attracted people with that. Got a lot of parking tickets, but it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> So that's kind of how we developed. And when we played high schools, which was really the the, the lifeblood kept us alive for dollars and cents. Um, but we really stopped playing clubs altogether. The high schools were really our bread and butter <clears throat> until they barred us because we dumped the pyro and we wanted beer in the dresser. So we couldn't play high schools anymore. <laughs> uh, you know, we put on a big show and did the best of the best in our own tunes, did uh, 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 did some Zep, did some Hendrix, you know, and just mixed them in with our own stuff. And we developed the following doing that. So then we got a record deal, or we had a record deal already, but we didn't make a record for a while, but we had a deal. How'd you get a deal? Before we had a band. So. <laughs> you had a deal before you had a band? Yeah. How'd that happen? A uh, friend of mine, I used to have a record label before trial. So I did a lot of things before trial, but uh, as a partner in a record label, and, uh, you know, we weren't a big record label, a small record label, we didn't have a ton of dough, but we, you know, we had a couple of items. And uh, a good friend of mine, I made friends with a guy who was the head of promotion for Warner Brothers Records in Canada. And we had been at industry functions and stuff. It hit it off. Really nice guy. So whenever he was going to do a cross Canada tour, he'd invite me to tag along. So when he did a big uh, show and tell for the, all the radio people in town, yeah, he'd, I'd, go, I'd be attended there. And he introduced me to all the radio people all across the country, which was cool. Then he left Warriors and started start the label to sign us at Records along with a guy named Al Bear who managed Brent Lightfoot and 
Freud passed away recently, just like last week, and uh, uh, his Albert, who was Tom's partner, passed away like a month ago. So it's kind of weird. There's deaths everywhere now. But anyway, so Tom, I went to Tom. I said, I, I got a proposition for you. I said, I was like, let's start this band. <laughs> it's going to be, it's going to be heavy metal. It's going to be three piece. That we're going to, we're going to just change the world. He goes, really? And I go, yep. And he says, how much do you need to advance? <laughs> I said, yep. Wow. <laughs> And Gil and I, we didn't have any guitar players, Gil and I. So uh, I, he said, so when, when will there be a band? I said, as soon as we get the right guitar player. And we went through a bunch of guys, and we, then we found Rick and convinced him it would be a smart move for him to come in the band. And, and here's, here's a record label, and here's a deal, and we're going to make records and all that. And he went, I'm in. So that's how really we started. I, I tell you, man. Those vocals between Gil and Rick are unbelievable. And I really feel that Gil and, you know, Gil is drumming and is singing are very underrated. You just don't really hear much people talk about what he was doing, you know? Yeah, I agree with you 100%. You know, he could, he could be, he's a very, very good player and, and a very good singer, you know? And it's like, but, you know, drummers and singers, you know, you think about it, there's not many of them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, drummer, the, the guy in Rare Earth, I think, was the singer. Yeah, um, the Eagles, uh, Phil Collins, Gill, you know, it's rare. It's rare. There's not like, a, there's not a lot. Just like there's not a lot of three-piece bands either, right? So uh, it's, it's, but it was good because, thank God, because it gave us that opportunity to break, you know, because, there's no way one guy could carry a whole show mixing it up in that high register all the time. Yeah. Uh, so it was, uh, it worked out great. You know, having two singers was the best thing. But, so you're right about that, for sure. Was the high ah. register influenced by Robert Plant era and Rush and, and that? Because there was that era where guy, you know, Boston, where they're just singing high, man. Dirty, you know, dirty. You know, I, no, it's like that's Rick's voice. That's a singing voice, right? Now, sometimes he went beyond a singing voice, way beyond. Like sometimes oh, yeah. he did, you know, a high E over C and stuff. There was like massively dry. I could bring tears to your eyes. Like, oh, shit, listen to that. Yeah, it's interesting when you see, when you hear the Lay It on the Line Us Festival version, man. First of all, that version has really got some muscle. And then he just goes up higher, you know, and you're like, whoa. Yeah, take me to another level, folks. Take me to another level, you know? Yeah. I now, used to be fun in the studio with him. I, I go, ah, Rick, you're, you're being lazy. You, you, could, you could kick it up a notch here, you know? <laughs> and he goes, okay, get me a beer. No, he didn't drink beer. Uh, one day, I got a glass of wine or something. He said, put up some penthouse pictures or something you know could be some inspiration and turn the lights down low and let me cry and sure enough he did it you know it's amazing yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was uh, reading something where steve perry was like you know i just kept trying to go higher and higher and higher and there's just no way now now some people could do it all the way to the end say like a do uh, Rob Halford still gets up there pretty high. Cornell was up in there, Chris Cornell. But yeah, you're not thinking back in 1979 when you're laying down the track that you're going to possibly be, be singing this 20 years later, you know? That's for sure. So uh, just uh, anecdotally on, on that uh, level, there's a, uh, a Triumph tribute record being done in Los Angeles. That Mike Clank, uh, producer of you know, Guns N' Roses, Appetite for Destruction, uh, Might Stay Crew, Mike's worked with everybody. Uh, so he, his job was to find artists that would you know cover Triumph songs, and they do their own arrangements, whatever. Great bands, you know, Kenny Aronoff and Phil X playing guitar, and, and just you know, incredible stuff. But a lot of guys passed because they couldn't do the Rick songs, right? It's just probably because we're looking for classic rock guys and talk to Paul Rogers, Paul Rogers, I can't do that. I don't want to embarrass myself, 
that's my kind of, there's a lot of guys that just pass because no, I can't touch that and do it justice. Now, um, once you guys do one more record and then you kind of call it quits, um, and then you did some gigs over the years sporadically, but there's no way you guys are ever going to get back together, right? Um, I you mean to tour to do a tour? Yeah, yeah. I don't think we're physically able to do that. I mean, we, you know, we got we did three songs for the documentary, and uh, and it was like rough a tooling up, just you know, because Gil and I hadn't played it in a while. And Rick was always playing. He was out on the road a lot. So he had good patience while we were hacking around trying to figure out, you know, I was trying to figure out where is my head going here? And Gil's going, what's a drum? <laughs> but Rick had good patience. And uh, after three or four rehearsals, we started to find the groove. And then when we actually did the gig for the fans for the documentary, uh, three songs, we were dead to the earth. Honestly, it's like just if they should be 14 vodkas, I just want to pass out. You know? <laughs> so the idea of a whole show, don't think so. I just like, like to say, Rick, Rick can't really hit those notes anymore. And uh, <laughs> even when you drop the key a bit, still, it's still not easy. Uh, well, yeah, we all got it for Gills have really hard of hearing now from having bothered so loud all those years. Uh, you know, so it's really tough you know, when you, and you're getting older. What have you been doing uh, since you you don't do music? Once that train stops and it's most of your life, was it tough to figure out what you wanted to do in life? Were you missing the adrenaline? What's going on there? So, um, you know, it was tough when the band just kind of stopped. And, you know, it's like without any, there was no kind of, Okay, let's take the train down down the track slowly, but keep it moving. It just went from okay, we just played for eighteen thousand people in Toronto, and the headline of the paper the next day is Rick leaves the band, and it's kind of like we went, oh, that's not the way it's supposed to work, but shit happens, so that's the way it was. So yeah, every time I went past the airport on the highway, I. I it's a steering wheel that was going to the right because that's I never went past the airport. I always turned into the airport for the highway. It was like just a reflex action, right? I thought it's so many hundreds of times. And uh, yeah, so I missed it. But you know, Gil and I started, I guess, in uh, 1990, we started jamming with some people and using the studio and doing some recording. Then we finished a record with Phil X on uh, uh, guitar, the Edge of Excess record. So that was kind of, that kept things kind of in a, in a groove. Went out and played some dates with Phil. You know, got him the gig at Bon Jovi, so he's really happy for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, very happy for that. He's actually, he's all over this record, the, or the tribute record. Phil was always available to play for Clint. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, so that kept us kind of busy. You know, we played a few dates and, uh, in the meantime, I was just trying to clean up business because it was a mess because there, there's just everything happened so, so suddenly. So I was there, I went, became kind of a, uh, a, a legal beagle a bit and an accounting a bit and went, okay, let's figure out who owes us money. Went after the record companies, found a whole bunch of dough that they owed us, like a whole bunch. And, uh, got out of some bad arrangements, um, made some new friends, made no enemies at all, just friends. And uh, uh, so we're periphery wise, you know, as a rounding business. Then, because our agent, our, our lawyer was smart back when we uh, signed with MCA, he put a, in a clause that uh, we get all the rights back to the material, all the records we owed again after a certain period of time. Wow. wow. 93 comes along and it's time to send letters to MCA saying, please return all master things, all artwork, all materials, all blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, you know, the phone lights up. What do you, what do you think you guys are doing? They're checking contract calls. And 
And they went, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so they went about it. They returned everything, which is great. So then it's like my job, I became like the triumph label manager and retooled everything, you know, redid all the artwork because they got such a cheap down on the CDs when they first came out. Uh, started our own label and it did very well. <laughs> did repackaging stuff. And so that was kind of my hot, that was a hobby, but it was something to do every single day, regardless of anything else. You know? So. That kept going for a long, long time until we sold the catalog recently, a few years ago, to Roundhill Music. Oh, you guys sold the catalog? Excellent. Yeah. That, yeah that, we were one of the first deals now. That seems to be the way to go these days, right? Sell the catalog because we really don't know what music's going to be worth down the road because the streaming, the money has dwindled. Uh, and, and especially now in this AI world, where people can just go, you know what? I'm just going to have this AI machine do a triumph style song and I'll play it at the NFL commercials and I don't have to pay anybody. Yeah, well, that's that's going to be uh, interesting, Leo. The lawyers are going to make a lot of money parsing that out, you know, somewhere, somehow. But uh, yeah, it's kind of, you know, we looked at it too, like estate planning, you know, you're getting older and, uh, you know, Gil and I go out for dinner one night, we get hit by a bus. You know, and our wives now on the catalog, they're going to get screwed, right? So, you know, who's, who's going to be kind to them about getting the right price for anything? So uh, we figured the smart thing to do was to just uh, let's find a buyer. And, you know, our lawyer in New York found a buyer. That's like just for... I went to visit him. I hadn't been to New York in years. I went to visit him. I said, Paul, well, you know, the, it's like the satellites for sale. And like, you know, that was four years later we made a deal because we had offers, but they weren't good. Now I just said, no, you know, not interested. And then the right offer came along. I'm like, yes, let's go for it. That's amazing, <laughs> man. That's amazing yeah. to be able to sell that catalog and, and that you owned it. You know, a lot of people don't understand. Most people get the the rights to their material back after 30 years, but uh you know, by then it's so gnarly. A lot of people aren't even around anymore and you, people are just battling. So it's great that you got that back. You're able to sell it and be able to live without freaking out, you know? Well, yeah. And, and plus it was, uh, it, it made us a lot of money um, you know, while we owned it. You know, we owned it for like how long? Two, five, three. You know, 20, 20 odd years, right? And it, it was made of, you know, so we sold a lot of records, like a lot of records. You know, so instead of, you know, getting your little puny royalty, you know, we were getting the whole, and, and it, it's, we had great suppliers, great manufacturers, great people that worked, you know, where we needed new artwork or whatever. And we had the studio and a mastering facility so we could pick stuff up. We could, you know, remaster it and all that. It's expenses for all, and I worked for free. So it was, it was okay. You know, it was, it was a good deal. But now, like, we're able to do this US Festival thing that's coming out, right? The vinyl. And, you know, limited edition. Nobody could afford to do that. You know, it makes no sense to make 750, you know, final faithful records. But we owed all the art. The artwork was ours. We had the photos. To be able to you know, take a, a, a nice staple set and put it together. Uh, Gil owns the studio, so the mastering room to remaster it, you know, took a long time to get that done properly. And, uh, you know, and our merch company is, is, is putting it out. So you can buy it from the Triumph merch store, and, but you can't go to Amazon and get it. That's amazing, man. It's such a, it's such a piece of history. Those Us Festival sets, I mean, they are fantastic. Each band was firing with all cylinders. Everybody was hungry and everybody wanted to kill. And, you know, it is just, it's just a day in history that will never be duplicated ever. Well, I don't think you'll ever get that many headliners in the same room again, so to speak, right? I mean, that's why... It's like you want to be there with your peers. And that's for us, that was like 
that was the deciding factor. It wasn't about the money. Uh, it was about you're there with your peers. These are the top fans of the day. And and you're part of it. So well, great. So, it's a lot like, you know, Bill Graham, what he did with those day on the greens. You know, you'll never get any of those lineups again, you know. Right. We we played, I don't know, probably five or six day on the greens with Bill. But Bill was actually with the original promoter of the S Festival. Right. Right. He was the buyer because he worked for Waz. And then for some reason they had a falling out. And uh, then Barry Faye from Faye Line Productions in Denver, you know, kind of took over. And that's who we ended up dealing with right, mainly. But we did deal with um, with Bill a little bit in advance of that. How great was right. Dan the Greens? I mean, I saw you with, uh, I think it was Sammy Hagar one on the, uh, on the uh, I believe it was the maybe Danger Zone tour for him. But those were just unbelievable right like if you look at those bills uh some of them i saw would be like ted nugent aerosmith acdc journey cheap trick you're just like what you know yeah yeah, yeah bill had a knack he was a very very good promoter he wasn't well liked by a lot of agents but he was a very very good promoter and we got a lot of great with him so. but our agent wouldn't deal with him at all he'd say you go make the deal with bill i'm not talking i don't talk to him <laughs> it was amazing. And Bill would go, okay, he'd come in the dressing room after the, the show, and we sold at the Cow Palace. And he came in, and there was a war in advance about how to advertise the show. And we said, Bill, you have to use TV. You know, so you can't just put an ad in the newspaper and expect to sell out with his pen. So we found, I said, you know, I think Bill made the deal with it. Just check our guarantee and just buy TV. Okay? That's it. You won't have to pay us a nickel unless. We get the first buddies out <laughs> and uh, sold up the cow towels. Bill comes to the dress room and said, so who's going to do the settlement? Because we got no agent, right? <laughs> to do it. And Dr. Bill, we just said, write us a check for what you think's fair. But, but Bill was notoriously a crook, you know, when it came to settlements. I saw both promoters were. Uh, but he wrote us a bigger check. We told, told uh, Troy, rest of the soul, our agent, what the check was. We went, I can't believe that. Like, you know what? If I would have been involved, you would have got half that. <laughs> wow. So wow. We, that's why we like Bill a lot. You know? <laughs> I love that Cow Palace. I saw so many shows in there. Um, it was, I went back recently and went into the venue. And it's so funny when you get older and you go in the venue, you go, wow, it's kind of smaller than I thought. When you're a kid, it just seemed massive. You know, you're seeing a band in there. It's crazy. It is, it is, it is. So yeah, um, so yeah, that's for the, the, the Triumph world. There's the the, um, the vinyl coming out, and there the, there is um, we're doing a uh, uh, the uh, the US Festival concert. The Triumph US Festival concert will be has been never on the Triumph official channel, which is like for some stupid reason it never was. So it's moving there. It's moved there, and will be there on the night of the twenty fifth of this month of May. Uh, they're airing it for the first time on the Triumph channel on YouTube. And uh, Rick, Mike, and Gil will be on the keyboard answering, the, you know, having chats with the fans during the, during the airing. So that'll be cool. So that's kind of our special celebration stuff. That's amazing, man. Congrats on everything. Glad you're still alive. And, and all these years of just... Uh fantastic music and the us festival i'll never forget it and i'm sure you never will forget it get this record on vinyl everybody uh the us festival the entire triumph set and check them out on their uh on their youtube and all of that thank you so much for doing the show my man all right my pleasure it's been fun yeah Take good care look forward to it next time all right thank you so much all right see you buddy see you